Prior to beginning the activity, please be sure to review the faculty information and disclosure statements, as well as the learning objectives. After listening to the activity, complete the post-test by clicking the Earn Credit link in the episode description. Downloadable slides and resources are also available. The following presentation is copyrighted by Medscape. No use, broadcast, or recording of this presentation or any part thereof is permitted without the written authorization of Medscape. The following presentation is part of a certified educational activity provided by Medscape Education and supported by an independent educational grant from Beijing. This program is presented by Medscape Education Global. Yeah, hello, my name is uh, Christian Bruske. I'm a medical director. Um, at the Institute of Experimental Cancer Research at the Comprehensive Cancer Center and University Hospital uh, in Ulm, Germany. Um, and I would love to welcome you to our program, which is uh, uh, carries the title Clinical Context of the Consensus, a review of the latest recommendations for Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia. It's really a pleasure to have Shirley Tsar with me, joining me today. She is a clinical lead at the UCLH Center for Waldenstrom's Macroglobulinemia and consultant hematologist, associate professor at the Department of Hematology, University College London Hospitals, NHS Foundation Trust in London in the UK. Shirley, and uh, welcome. And uh, yeah, I think uh, we will have a great time. And uh, our idea is to discuss in the next uh, around 30 minutes what has changed actually in Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia, in particular, when we look at the um, uh, guidelines we are using in Europe. So the ESMO guidelines, when we look back, they were published 2018, which means they are more than four years uh, uh, now passed through. And uh, keeping these ESMO guidelines uh, in mind, we would love to discuss you know, what has changed or what is valid in the year 2023 when we talk about diagnosing patients, molecular testing, and of course, uh, probably most importantly, our treatment uh, approaches. So we will discuss this uh, patient case also to illustrate where we are standing in managing uh, patients with uh, Waldenstrom's uh, disease first line and also in the relapsed or refractory situation. So perhaps, yeah, what has changed? I think probably we have more emphasis on molecular studies in Waldenstrom. So MIDI-88, CXCR4, I think it plays a more important role nowadays. We have perhaps new biomarkers such as TP53 uh, mutations, um, I think this is one area of change, I would say. Um, and the second one is, of course, treatment. We have learned that, um, yeah, for instance, um, ibrutinib is less effective in certain molecular subtypes, uh, such as CXCR4 mutation, mutated patients. We have data now on ibrutinib plus rituximab, and importantly, we have the next generation our second generation covalent BTK inhibitors such as anabutinib. I think also this has uh, um, yeah, brought really some changes in, in our daily management of the patients. So what do you think, Shirley? Did we forget some major issues or is this also in your view um, more or less the, are these the key changes when you go back the five years. Thank you, Christine. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I think you've gave, given a very good introduction and summary of, of what's happened in the last few years. There's been a huge emphasis on refining both diagnostic response criteria, treatment methodologies in WM, because whilst we have very effective chemoimmunotherapy, there are concerns about toxicity, and with the advent and development of uh, novel therapies, which perhaps we can't call that novel anymore, the BTK inhibitors, for example, uh, techniques, we're seeing potential impact of different um, mutational 
entities uh, on the disease, both its behavior and perhaps outcomes when we do different treatments. So I, I think that uh, this is important to uh, consider and take into account. Perhaps one should look upon it in a, a real world setting and a clinical trial setting. There are, I think, some subtle, well, there are differences in the way we should perhaps approach these. Yeah, surely. So we discussed a little bit, you know, um, in a summary, what has changed in the last four to five years when we look back to the ESMO 2018 guidelines. So perhaps now we go through a little bit uh, uh, in, in more detail. So uh, first, you know, when we define Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia, are there any major changes in the definition of this disease when we compare uh, 2018 and now the consensus recommendations which were just published? Um, what do you think? Yes, I think there are some very new, useful new recommendations, which do capture the field uh, in a helpful way. The diagnosis of WM is based on an IgM monoclonal protein and unequivocal evidence of bone marrow involvement by LPL, irrespective of the total IgM concentration. Um, so this is a fact. I think this is widely accepted. And of course, patients may have these criteria with or without symptoms, namely asymptomatic or symptomatic um, WM, and that, of course, then gives a, a nudge for whether patients may need treatment or not. In the um, criteria for diagnosing WM in the new consensus guidelines from the international workshop, the 11th one, there are some very useful additions in my view. Um, first of all, in the IgMM GUS category, the IgMM GUS that we all know and talk about uh, has been subdivided into two groups. One is the sort of not otherwise specified category, which includes what I would regard as the traditional IgMM GUS, which is mid-88 mutated, usually, or unmutated. The presence of detectable monotypic B cells, um, you know, fairly standard looking IgMM GUS. However, there is um, the so-called IgMM GUS plasma cell type, which has now been described and this is considered to be a precursor of multiple myeloma, because we know, of course, that there is overlap between WM and IgM myeloma, and these entities behave differently and need different treatment. So I think when looking at the MGUS situation, if there are predominantly plasma cells, and perhaps the presence of the 1114 translocation, we should now call this IgM MGUS plasma cell type. So I think this is a very interesting and important um, addition. Uh, in the new guidelines. I think the other aspects are pretty much as they were. And there's this very useful table in the consensus guidelines, which sort of delineates the different categories. So I don't know, Christian, if you agree, but I think this is a good step forward. No, absolutely. I think you have very nicely summarized that, uh, you know, there's not only one category, but that we have to discriminate between uh, different categories. But I think also as a take home message for our audience, so Waldenstrom is defined as it was before. So it's a very robust definition where you need a monoclonal IgM independent of the IgM concentration. You need bone marrow infiltration by a lymphoplasma silic lymphoma. Uh, so it has become a little bit perhaps more complex, but in general, it has stayed the same. You can define Waldenstrom by these different criteria. Then we, of course, we have asymptomatic and symptomatic Waldenstrom. And we will come back to this, um, yeah, how to manage uh, asymptomatic Wildenstrom. But I think also here, nothing has has changed. So there was also some discussion, Shirley, with regard to the response criteria. Um, so um, because a working group tried to simplify uh, the uh, response criteria, which are quite complicated, and you know, in daily clinical life. Many of our colleagues don't like complexity when it when they want to define the response of a patient. So, uh, so the idea was surely to more or less rely on IgM, correct? Yeah, that's right. So I think just taking us back a little bit, the original response criteria were proposed after the second international workshop in 2003, which is obviously a long time ago in therapeutic and biological terms. 
but then revised after the third workshop in 2006. But then, of course, there was additional clinical data, uh, increasing numbers of high quality responses to meal combinations, and, and actually confirmation from studies that categorical response is predictive of clinical outcome. Um, and this really led to the further modification at the sixth international workshop. So as you said, the um, so-called simplified response criteria were thinking about using IgM response for categor categorical responses. However, there was um, discussion about the, mod the modification that happened in the sixth workshop noted that there should be a new category of very good partial response, not just having CR and PR, et cetera, because this category was found to be clinically relevant and significant for progression-free survival. And furthermore, the or, although originally the VGPR category required a complete resolution of lymph node-based disease effectively, EEM, extramedullary disease, the more recent so-called modified criteria, which are now cited in the IWWM 11 uh, document, suggest that the assessment of extramedullary disease is not required for attainment of VGPR, PR, or minor response MR, but is of course mandated for CR, which makes sense. And I guess the reason for this, and I, I think it's a, it, it's, it is valid, is first of all, to assess extramedullary disease, one has to scan the patient. I think in a clinical trial setting, these things are very, very important because you want to really measure disease response with accuracy. But in a real life setting, if someone has a degree of lymphadenopathy, it's not bothering them, it's not gonna change the treatment. Do we want to put real life patients through additional scanning? This is exposure to more radiation. It's more of use of resources. So it is a balance between rigor, uh, but this may prove overzealous for some patients where the goal is simply to improve well-being. And so the so-called simplified IWM6 criteria are now proposed to be re referred to as the IWWM11 criteria, so that we're looking mainly at IgM and I guess assessment of EMD is something that one should consider on a clinical basis, but should included should be included in clinical clinical trials. Yeah, I think it's a as you said, and as the the, the name says, it really simplifies um, response assessment in daily clinical life. So, because as soon as you have no CR and no progressive disease, you can just look at the IgM and you can calculate your, your response assessment. So we already mentioned, uh, Shirley, uh, molecular profiling and the role of uh, MID-88 and CXCR4 mutations. So um, anything new from these consensus recommendations? I think we already mentioned that there is more focus on molecular profiling of genotyping, if you want so. So perhaps we start with mid-88. I think we agree whenever possible, all the patients should be uh, typed for mid-88 mutations because we know that it has some implications for, di for diagnosis, but also for clinical management, correct? Indeed. I, I mean, I think it's important to remember, of course, that the wild type group are a very small proportion of WM patients overall. Um, and but but they do seem to have different outcomes to certain therapies. Uh, and so I think if you have a truly wild type patient, it's worth knowing this so that we can improve outcomes overall, because at the end of the day, although the numbers are small, they, they, these are still cases that uh, that need appropriate management. There are, of course, non-L265P mutations that um, affect mid-88, which are more difficult to, to assess. Perhaps NGS is a way of, of looking at these. I, I mean, more work needs to be done in this group, but I think generally testing for mid-88 mutational status is important. CXCR4 is a different, uh, well, it's a more difficult problem. It's present, the mutations of CXCR4 are present in, in perhaps 30 to 40% of patients with WM and 
The clinical characteristics are a little bit different. People tend to present with more, indeed, in fact, extramedullary disease, hyperviscosity, um, perhaps the response rates and timing is slower than those who are not mutated, but very difficult to do in a uniform way. And uh, because there are many different mutational locations, there are non nonsense and mis missense mutations. So I think, you know, I I'm interested to know how you view the CXCR4 mutation and, and how you address this in, in practice and, and what you feel has come out of the... Um, the, the consensus guidelines. Yeah, I think uh, the consensus guidelines, they really, you know, emphasized the clinical relevance of CXCR4. And this is now different when you compare it to five years ago, because as you said, we have learned that CXCR4 mutations really shape the clinical behavior of Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia. So it's clearly relevant to have this information. But as you said, it's not easy because there are so many mutations. So um, the technique used is normally next generation sequencing, but uh, the sensitivity of this method is of course lower uh, compared to PCR technology. So normally you need to enrich for CD19 positive B cells or malignant B cells, which is a problem in daily clinical life. So I think what we have to state is that in many cases, and we have to be aware of this, there might be false negative results. So um, uh, the results coming back that CD CXCR4 is not mutated, but uh, a result which is due to the low sensitivity of the method and the lack of the possibility to enrich for CD19 positive cells. So I, I think you should discuss this with your local uh, pathologist or local lab. Uh, which is doing this analysis in a very open way to discuss the possibility perhaps to enrich for CD19 positive cells. But I think the recommendation is clear. You should try also as a clinician to enforce, um, um, to enforce the analysis of a CXCR4 mutation in your patients whenever possible. When NGS is not available, of course, you could go for a more simplified approach that you use PCR technology to discover the most uh, redundant and most frequent CXCR4 mutation, the S338X mutation, because then you don't need to enrich for CD19 positive cells. Yeah. So I think as a take home message, yes, we would like to have the mutation status of both genes. MID88 is easy, let's say, and sensitive and whenever possible, try also to, also to get information about CXCR for mutation analysis. So there were also mentioned in the new consensus recommendations, other genetic alterations such as TP53, but I think surely probably still a little bit early. Um, I think all the groups worldwide now start to look at the impact of P53 deletions and mutations in Waldenström, but so far it's difficult you know, to adapt our treatment according to TP53, or what is your opinion? Yeah, absolutely. I think ideally, and I, the consensus guidelines do suggest that this, that <clears throat> ideally we should test for TP53, P, TP53 disruptions in all patients who are going to have therapy and repeat it before any new line of therapy. Um, NGS is probably a practical way of seeking this mutation out. Now, increasingly in my practice, because of the use of NGS, we, we do come across TP53 disruptive cases. And I sort of wring my hands, really, because I'm not quite sure how this should influence my practice. Um, clearly, in the setting of a clinical trial, this is the ideal way forward. But many patients are not going to be in clinical trials. And so, you know, what it does is it, it, it just puts on a light in my mind as to potentially a, a, a more tricky clinical situation that is ahead, but it doesn't necessarily play out in every patient in this way. It raises questions in my mind about the utility of chemoimmunotherapy, for example. Uh, it also raises questions about whether we should be using BTK inhibitors. I mean, the CLL experience has become very altered by, by the presence of TP53 mutations. So I think there are, at the moment, there are more questions than answers. Yeah, completely, uh, completely agree. And I think we will know
much more in, in a few years you know, when, when groups have analyzed their prospective data with regard to the T53 impact. Shirley, you brought a patient case with you, and I think it would be great when we just go through and see what we can do for this poor patient. Excellent. So this is a 60-year-old patient who has previously been fit and well, um, but he presents with gradual onset fatigue, breathing difficulty on exertion, and actually symptoms suggestive of intermittent claudication when he walks. He, he walks, he gets pain in his legs, and then he has to kind of stop. He's actually not really been a smoker. So this is a curious thing. He's not sort of known to have vascular issues. Um, he does, however, have paroxysmal AF and is on a, on a DOAC for this. This was just found incidentally. Um, so on questioning, um, and this is something I always ask about, to be honest, is does he have intolerance of the cold? Um, and in fact, he does. So initial tests showed that he's actually quite anemic with the hemoglobin of 70 grams per liter, but his white cells and platelet count are normal. He's got a pretty high IgM level of 55 grams per liter, and he has an IgM lambda power protein of 45 grams per liter. Now, I know that plasma viscosity is not measured everywhere. Uh, we, we do it in our institution, and he has a very high viscosity of greater than seven millipascal, uh, which fit with my clinical suspicion based on his, um, his symptoms. Um, so we did some, obviously we moved on to further tests and he had a bone marrow which showed heavy infiltration, 80% by CD5 negative BNHL with plasmacytic differentiation, which was deemed by the pathologist to be in keeping with lymphoplasmacytic lymphoma. And he did indeed have the L265P mutation and uh, the CXCR4S338X mutation. And in fact, just to make matters more tricky, he had deletion of 17P on fish. He had a CT of his whole body, which showed moderate lymphadenopathy above and below the diaphragm and a spleen of 19 centimeters. And because of his cold symptoms, we tested for cryoglobulin, which at the best of times can be very difficult because you have to keep the sample warm, et cetera. And he did indeed have a cryoglobulin present of type one category. So in summary, we have this patient who has quite a complex clinical background. Uh, we have the diagnostic data, and I think we all agree that he is in need of treatment. Um, Christian, I mean, I'd be curious to know what you would think of such a case like this. How would you manage him? Yeah, I think first, you know, what is different to the year 2018, I'll probably look more on the genotypes, so mid-88 mutated, CXCR4 mutated, I think this would be new now. Uh, 17P deletion, we discussed this already, also like a new aspect now, five years after these 2018 ESMO guidelines. And of course, we have in, in mind that we have now BTK inhibitors available, yeah, and also approved, ibotinib, sanobotinib, ibotinib plus rituximab, but of course, uh, 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 medical science does not change uh, completely. So I think it's very clear it's a patient in need of treatment because still we have to mention, Shirley, also in the newest recommendation documents, watch and wait is the way to go for asymptomatic uh, violence from patients. Here it's clear a need in, for treatment. Um, as you said, so again, probably no change to the former guidelines. Hyperviscosity um, is important here when we think about uh, clinical management. So uh, plasmapheresis is something we do when uh, patients have clear-cut hyperviscosity symptoms. And then, of course, here, what we can discuss this, now you would have the possibility of a BTK inhibitor, but of course, you still have also the possibility to uh, use immunochemotherapy. And uh, we know that um, Bendamustin rituximab is a very active drug, rapidly debulking. Uh, so I'm curious what you did. Well, we did indeed plasma exchange this patient because he had symptomatic hyperviscosity. He was quite anemic, so it enabled us to give him a little bit of blood transfusions as well. Now, in the UK, we are not able to use um, BTK's eyes up front. So we commenced him on bendamustine 
and rituximab, but we deferred the rituximab because of the risk of IgM flare. And so we gave him cycle one um, and cycle two. We actually moderated the dose of bendamustine because my feeling was with a heavy infiltration of his marrow, his normal bone marrow reserve would be limited and he'd be at risk of, of cytopenias. And indeed, he did develop neutropenic fevers after each cycle of chemotherapy because he didn't have much um, reserve to, to, to recover his counts. Um, so we also gave him GCSF support with each cycle and we continued to plex him, plasma exchange him because his paraprotein was not really going down as quickly as we would have hoped. We then added in rituximab from cycle three because there is this tension between getting the therapeutic benefit from rituximab, which is clearly proven to be a very important agent in all B cell malignancies. We added this from cycle three and he had quite a vigorous reaction to this. And this is again, something that I've observed in patients with, with high levels of IgM. It's, the, the, it's like the system is, is sort of on fire really. And so they're more likely to, to react to rituximab. So this proved to be very difficult and he did get IgM flare. And in fact, that sort of caused him to have progressive cryoglobulin symptoms, you know, he, which I, again has been observed in my practice that IgM mediated conditions in the short term can get worse before they get better. And in fact, he developed some skin ul ulceration on his limbs. Um, so it was proving to be very, very complex. And so we did, um, then we decided, we were thinking now what, what would be the options uh, in this case? Um, so he has a complex clinical picture of cryoglobulinemia and hyperviscosity. He's also got a history of paroxysmal AF, which means how will he behave in the presence of a, a BTK inhibitor? Uh, as you said, um, we can't actually give ibrutinib in the UK now, but if you had the choice, it's not something I would reach for in the first place because he is CXCR4 mutated. And also the, the, the risks of um, cardiac dysrhythmias are perhaps higher in, in ibrutinib compared to zanibrutinib um, based on the Aspen data. And he's got poor prognostic features, uh, such as the CXCR4 mutation and TP53 TP disruption. He appears chemorefractory, so we wondered about the availability of clinical trials. Um, this varies from country to country. Um, at the moment in the UK, we do have uh, some, uh, we have the nemtobrutinib trial, um, which is a non-covalent uh, inhibitor. And we also have some BTK degrader trials. Um, we also have the CloverWAM study, which is iopofacine, a radio immunoconjugate. Um, but the latter requires decent blood counts. The question is, should we go ahead and give him um, There, And we mustn't forget, actually, that you know, bortezomib-based therapy can be useful in these patients. Um, but yeah, so this was my thinking. Uh, in this case. Yeah, I think it's, an, it's a very interesting case because it also illustrates, Shirley, we don't have so many options to the end. So in these patients who are very aggressive from their clinical course, yeah, I think you did the right thing with immunochemotherapy. Now you would try probably um, yeah, because of the cardiac, uh, less, the cardiac profile of this patient. But what, what would we do when Zanu Rutinib is, is not working anymore? So, um, and, and there we see that options are actually uh, not that many outside of clinical trials. So I think we should really emphasize here, whenever possible, the patients should participate in clinical trials. So, um, yeah, so um, perhaps just to summarize first line treatment, I think this is also nicely um, 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 put together in the uh, consensus recommendations and you, you can read these uh, consensus recommendations, the frontline treatment. This is uh, part one of the newest recommendations. Uh, I think it's very clear immunochemotherapy is still a very important backbone of treatment. Um, I think um, DRC and Arbenda mustin are the most commonly used immunochemotherapies. And we have, as already mentioned, also in first line available, 
um, the covalent BTKI, sanobotanib, ibotanib plus minus um, rituximab. Um, also, I think a big change in the last five years because we learned that BTK inhibitors are a great treatment, correct, for Bing Neal? Yeah, so Bing Neal, I, I believe, is more common than we, we think. Um, and so it's good to have a low index of suspicion because if you if you find some uncharacteristic features in a patient, um, then, you know, a lumbar puncture, imaging in a lumbar puncture may, may reveal this condition, which is very treatable. So yeah, Bing Neal syndrome, uh, lymphoplasmocytic lymphoma in the CNS. Um, indeed, the BTK inhibitors do cross the blood brain barrier, so they do have a role. I think exactly what that role is remains unclear because some patients have very bulky disease at presentation, either you know, encasing the brain or in the leptomeninges, sometimes there's heavy infiltration in, uh, rather there's a lot of circulating cells in the CSF. And sometimes big neal and peripheral nerve disease coexist um, as, as because the nervous system is, is basically one contiguous system. Uh, so I think, yep, yeah, I think the BTKIs have a potentially very important role, but sometimes, you, one may need to debulk the patient first with the more traditional methods, um, methotrexate-based, uh, but again, tailoring that to the individual and remembering that if the performance status of the patient is poor due to the Bing Neal syndrome, then the only way forward is to actually address that. And sometimes you need to be going in with some uh, CNS penetrating chemoimmunotherapy but then perhaps moving on to BTK inhibitor to consolidate uh, the process. Uh, it also depends on whether there's systemic disease as, as well as the CNS disease. So it, it's quite a complex scenario for sure. But at least we have some, seen some progress with the BTK inhibitors. And I think uh, we agree this is really standard of care, uh, even in first line when you have a patient with being near to to try the BTK inhibitors. Okay, let's move for a second to the relapse refractory situation. I think um, you, Shirley, you wrote the part two of our newest consensus recommendations dealing with a, a treatment sequence in the relapse refractory situation. So I think um, without going into details, of course, what is important is the du duration of response to the first line treatment or to the previous treatment the fitness of the patient, whether he got immunochemotherapy before or already the BTK inhibitor. So these are all factors which have, of course, an impact on your treatment selection. But I think we can also here state that um, there are not so many different treatment options available when the patients suffer from recurrent relapses in Waldenström. And I think we for sure need uh, new ideas, new treatment concepts, also in Weidenström. I think we have seen progress in the last five years, and uh, I hope we discuss this a little bit in the limited time uh, we had. So with regard to diagnosis, uh, molecular profiling, the impact of mid 88 cxcr 4 mutations, uh, the impact of these mutations on our treatment selection. Uh, I think you presented a wonderful case, Shirley, showing how complex management of Weidenstrom's patients can be. So I think we have to come to an end because of our time constraints. So Shirley, thank you again for this great uh, discussion. I want to thank you um, as audience for participating in this activity and please continue on to answer the questions that follow and complete uh, the um, evaluation. Thanks a lot and uh, hopefully see you soon at one of the wonderful Wildenströms meetings. Thanks. This program was presented by Medscape Education Global.